Good evening. Thank you to those who have chosen to attend, are watching, or are listening to the fourth of four debates involving candidates for the state representative seat for the new 2nd Franklin District, which will now be comprised of the communities of Athol, Irving, Gill, New Salem, Orange, Petersam, Phillipston, Royalston, Templeton, Wendell, Warwick, and part of Belchertown. My name is Andres Camano, Senior News Editor of the Gardner News, and will serve as the moderator for tonight's debate at the French King Bowling Center in Irving. Our thanks to the Bowling Center for the use of their facility. The format of this debate will include three-minute opening statements by each of the three candidates. Unfortunately, Rick Schrober uh, was unable to attend. He did provide a opening statement. Unfortunately, I did not bring it here. I apologize for that. Uh, Nonetheless, we have uh, Representative Denise Andrews and Susanna Whipsley uh, here for the debate, and they will uh, provide opening statements, uh, three minutes each. And uh, the order was pulled out of a hat for opening statements as well as closing statements, and also uh, beginning on first question. And in each of those cases, uh, uh, Ms. Lee will be the first respondent in all three cases. Uh, and. Um, Again, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Schober was unable to attend tonight's debate as he has a job uh, far east of here and was unable to attend. Uh, please welcome Representative Andrews and Ms. Lee. After the opening statements, uh, that will be followed by a total of eight questions from myself to the candidates, with the first candidate provided two minutes and 15 seconds to answer the second, a minute and 45 seconds to answer. After that segment, there are going to be 18 minutes for each candidate to ask a question to each other uh, for a total of up to six questions with a, uh, a candidate able to ask a question to a candidate with a response allowed for up to a minute and a half with a rebuttal time of up to 45 seconds and if necessary, a second rebuttal provided back to the one who originally uh, provided the question. Now in our final segment, there are going to be up to 18 minutes of audience provided questions with the first candidate given, again, two minutes and 15 seconds to answer and the second one, a minute and 45 seconds. And we have our uh, questions already on index cards, so we're all set with that. Now if there's any time remaining, I will read from an additional group of previously approved questions, but from all indications, we'll be all set with audience uh, questions. Uh, our final segment will provide up to two minutes each for closing statements by Representative Andrews and Ms. Lee. And again, thank you for those who are interested in learning about the candidates in your community, whether they are here tonight or are watching or listening to tonight's debate. And before we begin, if I could ask those of you in the audience to please turn off your cell phones. Now in addition, while I, we understand that the audience enthusiasm uh, for your candidates, we would like to provide the opportunity for the candidates to have their full say in this final debate prior to Election Day. To discourage interruptions and to allow for a smooth flowing of the debate, if there are any moments where applause or interruptions are caused by supporters of a specific candidate, that candidate will be dealt a 30-second deduction in their response time on their next question. In other words, such interruptions will only hurt the candidate that you support. So I encourage those of you in the audience to hold your applause until the completion of the debate. And please remember, to vote in the general election on Tuesday, November 6th. Now our opening statements, again, Ms. Lee will be first and Representative Andrews will be second. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the Gardner News and Andres for coming out and um, helping us to organize this evening. Also, Chip Jones, um, Sam Kismarzik, and Mitch Groski for putting this together. When you go to vote on November 6th, you'll be asked to choose between two people who have nothing in common other than their gender. I'm a committed and dedicated member of my community who has spent my life in this area trying to create a better existence for my neighbors. I believe in open and transparent government and will work hard to ensure that your wishes are carried out and your voices are heard. I do not believe that the answer is to blindly throw money at government agencies which are poorly managed and have no oversight or accountability. I want to work 
to look out for your tax dollars, the hard-earned money that operates this Commonwealth. I'm a member of the Republican Party, but I don't always agree with their platform. I'm willing to reach across the aisle and work collaboratively with people who have different beliefs and views. Many lifelong Democrats are supporting me because they feel I'm the best re representative of the people of this district. I was born in Athol. I've lived there my whole life. I'm a seventh generation resident of Athol. I'm a business owner in the town of Athol, and I work every day with my family to create jobs for people in our community. I've spent my life volunteering for the people of my community because that's where my heart is. And I intend to continue that um, throughout the rest of my life. I humbly ask you for your support and your vote on November 6th because I believe I am the best representative of the people of this area. Thank you. Good evening. It is a pleasure to be here and I want to thank everyone who came out tonight and made this happen. It's good for the community and it's good for democracy. As a state representative for the 2nd Franklin District, it is an honor and a pleasure to serve people in an area I love and respect. In the same way as many of you, I am deeply concerned about the state of our co country and communities. I first stepped into public service because we are in need of people working together to rebuild our country, one life, one family, and one business at a time. I believe that we must together step up and improve by both strengthening our long-standing fundamentals as well as to evolve and innovate and bring new capacity, compassion, and solutions to our communities. With this, my areas of focus have been and will continue to be as your state representative, good jobs and smart economic development, strong fiscal stewardship, excellent constituent services, senior and veteran services, good leadership that delivers the results that we need. Bringing broad, comprehensive, thoughtful, and effective solutions across all these critical areas is my mission and responsibility as your state representative. Since redistricting was announced, I've been diligently learning the seven new towns and continuing to serve the six of the existing district. I'm excited about the potential of this new district. Through my 25 years in business as, uh, with a big company, five with a small company, and a year and a half as your legislator, I have developed complex problem-solving skills, work with others very well, and deliver results that count. However, my most important learning on this job has come through the conversations with many of you across the district. Listening to your ideas, desires, and needs for your families, your communities, has given me the clarity and the urgency to do my job as your state representative. My personal mantra, to whom much is given, much is required. I hold myself to a very hard standard and I do my best every day for this community. In my first term, my team and I have established knowledge and relationships that are delivering results for our district. We would like that honor to continue to do that work on behalf of the families of this district. I'm asking for your support, partnership, and vote on November 6th so that we can together continue to make progress in this beautiful district for your families and this community. Thank you. All right, now we will move on to the moderator questions. And uh, the first response will be to Ms. Lee. And playing off a little bit of uh, something that Representative Anders just uh, talked about. Upon talking to voters on the campaign trail in the area of communities of Irving, Gill, New Salem, Wendell, Warwick, and Belchertown, what would you cite as the most common concerns amongst the voters that you hear from, and how best would you work in Boston to alleviate those issues presented to you? Well, jobs, 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 and jobs. People are concerned about how they're going to support their families and how they're going to continue to live their lives in comfort and not with the fear of losing their home and their communities. Jobs keep people together. Jobs keep communities together. When we lose jobs, many people have to lose their homes, move to other communities to get jobs. Um, the, the situation in Massachusetts is, is very dire. Um, as I've said before, the greatest display of the lack of jobs in this area is when an incredibly qualified woman has to go all the way to New Jersey to find a second job rather than stay in this district. And f jobs are breaking up families right now. One of my friends just moved to Virginia. He had to because that was where he found work. So he left his children 
and went to Virginia to work. Jobs are what's going to save our communities. It, jobs will bring better public safety and better education to people in the area. As a, job own, as a business owner at Whips Incorporated, I am a job creator. In the last four years, we've doubled the amount of our production space and we've increased our full-time benefited employees by 125%. I know what it takes for business success and I'll work to do that. I'll work to reduce government regulations, especially the duplicate ones. Um, hidden taxes and the cost of doing business in Massachusetts hurt a lot of small businesses. Inventory tax, unemployment insurance, workmen's compensation insurance. We have to look at all of this and see why is Massachusetts one of the least friendly states to do business in. The reason Whips Incorporated has grown and the reason we're in Athol, Massachusetts is because that's where we're from, that's our home. People aren't coming out to Massachusetts or even the second Franklin district in droves because we don't welcome business and we need to welcome businesses. Thank you, Mr. Representative Andrews. Number one area of concern is jobs. However, education and services and making sure that we have strong representation in Boston from a Western Mass delegation is very important as well. Services particularly to veterans and seniors uh, and the safety net services to take care of pre-K kids, families in need of transition that have lost their jobs for months, and to help them move through this difficult time. Jobs clearly is the number one area to help lift everybody's life, and it's needed here. We're 2% higher than the average unemployment in the Commonwealth, and we have a 2% higher educated workforce. So we have the talent, we need to get the jobs here. I spent all day Wednesday or actually all day Thursday at Smith College with the Mass Development Group, 25, 30 people with some of the brightest heads in, in the Commonwealth on what's going on on job creation in Massachusetts. Manufacturing was the focus. Our area has a technical right to get manufacturing jobs here. We have generations of skilled workers, tool and die, paper making, et cetera. And the good news in Massachusetts is that the manufacturing jobs are starting to come back. And so we worked, uh, there's three of us down there from our district, two from Athol and myself, and we went, reached out to those folks to say we want them to work with us, with the Federal Reserve Bank, the folks from Northeastern, and our team here that's working on economic development to look at what's the rural model to grow jobs. There's been a lot of work on gateway cities, the big cities in our Commonwealth, and now it's time to get at the rural models. And so we've asked to be at the head of that pack to study that, be part of it, and create jobs here. Thank you, Representative Andrews. Our next question, starting with Representative Andrews. From my understanding, a task force had supposedly been working on a long-range economic strategy for the region. Does it need to be modified because it was seen as weighted towards Greenfield, which has since been eliminated from the communities representing the second Franklin seat? And to Representative Lee, how do you want to quantify an economic development strategy for the new district? And do you see anything that can be salvaged from the previous task force effort? The task force has been working on northern tier development from Gardner all the way through with a focus on our district, which was Athol through Greenfield. It hasn't been heavily weighted to Greenfield at all. In fact, we heavily moved resources and focus to the North Quabbin area by setting up a business roundtable to focus on the clusters that we want to develop. The main clusters that we're working on is agriculture, manufacturing, tourism, um, and green energy. And so when you look, we're on a 10-year plan. We've got to get investment and we've got to get more planning and leadership capacity to bring those ideas and dreams that the community has had for years in the North Quabbin area to fruition. We need to broaden it and bring in Templeton and broaden it south to bring in the new towns. However, in the new district, there's more similarities, I think, and there'll be more equal uh, voice. Again, the cluster still makes sense. So we're on the right path, uh, working with Congressman Over. What we need to do is get Congressman McGovern after the elections in the boat and continue to drive um, the progress on those areas. Transportation is one of those um, areas of focus. The east-west rail for tourism in, commuters out, 
and uh, that is one of the strategy areas to work on. And then really looking at how do we revitalize the villages centers, which there's some good progress going on. And then leverage some of the area's strengths, farming, manufacturing, you heard me talk to, um, and get our education connected to the need. Right now we have a shortage of the hard skills, welding, some of the IT programming, and some of the fabrication. There's some advanced technologies coming, particularly in uh, fabrication of metals and plastic that we're in good position in Western Mass to take advantage of. We have uh, work underway to get the technical schools, perhaps some of the community colleges. Looking at a satellite technical training center in the North Quabbin, high probability in Athol. Again, these projects take time. I know how to drive business deals. I know how to bring solutions to the table and get people excited and invested in owning progress for our area. Thank you, Representative Andrews. Ms. Lee. Uh, frankly, we don't have 10 years. In 10 years, um, some of us will be close to Social Security age. Uh, we need jobs now. Um, there's no sh shortage of welders and machinists in the second Franklin district either because every day we have people coming into WIPS Incorporated filling out applications. Over the years we've had a few applicants. Now we have stacks of qualified people looking for work. There isn't a shortage of welders, there isn't a shortage of machinists, there's a shortage of jobs. They talk about bringing in a commuter rail. We don't need a commuter rail to bus our people somewhere else to work. We need jobs in our area. We need people in towns working and supporting their families. Um, the number of foreclosures we have in the area is directly co correlated to the, um, the high unemployment that we have. We need help, we need it now. One of the things we can do, because Gateway Communities doesn't help any of the communities in this area, because it's required to have 30,000 people or more um, in the city before they'll get the help. We need the state to look at all of the towns in the district and measure them based on their need, based on their median income, and based on the rate of foreclosure, and offer tax incentives in correlation with the need of the area. That's what we need to do. And again, we don't have 10 years. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Our next question. Knowing how one presidential candidate often refers to long, a long list of tasks he plans to check off if elected on quote unquote day one, what do you see as your priorities that you honestly seek as items you can accomplish within the limitations of a two year term as a state representative? I like that. Um, I am a dreamer. I think it's important to look out more, um, you know, having a five year, 10 year goals. But my first goals would be to get out and talk to the businesses that are already existing and see what we can do to help them expand. One of the um, things WIPS Incorporated took advantage of was tax increment financing, which gave us a small bit of help for the new development that we put in. Um, I also think it's important that we get results and not rhetoric, because everybody promises things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually get out and work hard and bring jobs to the area. I'm gonna work with existing businesses and try to get them to expand. Um, one of the other things I wanna do is at the State House, show people what the second Franklin District is. I don't wanna to go to Beacon Hill. I wanna bring Beacon Hill to the second Franklin District. I want them to see our daily struggles. I want them to see that we're not conquered in act and in air. I want them to see everybody in this room for who we are and we're generations of people who have lived and worked together and shared our lives and been a community for a long time and we're struggling. And I want the people on Beacon Hill to see what we deal with every day and what our struggle is and tell them it's time for them to help us. It's our turn. Thank you. Representative Andrews. Could you repeat the question? Knowing how one presidential candidate often refers to a long list of tasks he plans to check off if elected on day one. What do you see as your priorities that you honestly seek as items that you can accomplish 
within the limitations of a two-year ter two term as state representative? Sure. First and foremost is constituent services. We have several hundred people that have called our office since we started in this job looking for help. Help from uh, veteran services at health, for their health treatment to how to start a business or how to prevent their home from foreclosure. For, so my first priority is doable and we're doing an excellent job with the help of the staff in my office. Constituent services. Second on economic development. I'm not talking wait 10 years to get jobs. I should be fired if I thought that. We have about 600 jobs we need to replenish to this area. We've already are underway about with 200. 60 at Rodney Hunt, 90 or so at the Walmart expansion, another 90 up at Athol Commons. You have different data and if you have resumes of welders, I suggest you share them with Rodney Hunt because you could help your neighbors be more successful and grow the community because we do have an issue matching people to the need. So my priority and doable will continue to be very up close and personal with the small business owners, whether it's a farmer, a construction service, or um, recruiting a bigger company to come in here and provide a new manufacturing uh, location. So that will continue to be what I work on every week and deliver. Also, when we go forward for budgets, local aid, keeping local aid a priority. We uh, increase funding for the towns. That's critically important to do that again, assuming that the state revenues stay where they have on a 5% growth. And then some bills. There are 7,000 bills that you walk into as a freshman. My approach was to study other wise people, adopt those. This time going in, I have 36 bills ready to present that will help address job growth and some of the actions that we know we need to take to improve our district. Thank you, Representative Andrews. And our next question, kind of playing off on something that you mentioned. While the Warren Group on Tuesday released data showing that housing sales and their prices across the state have risen in, uh, in September, with the price rising 8% compared to September of last year. By comparison, in Franklin County, foreclosures continue to be a problem, with 69 completed foreclosures since January, according to the County of Registry, Registry of Deeds. How best do you see to seek to find ways to improve the picture for the housing market in this region? First is to keep people in their homes. Our office uh, sponsored a foreclosure prevention session Wednesday night. We had families come. We had excellent coverage by the Daily News so that folks that couldn't come or perhaps might be embarrassed to come could get help on keeping their homes and keeping those occupied and keeping our neighborhoods healthy. Second, we need to refresh our look and our image and ambassadors. We need to be excited about where we live and share that with people. Draw them in. We're building, um, well, what's coming to town is a new college in Northfield. Talking to a realtor coming in through the bowling alley and had talked to some previous realtors. How do we reach out and attract them to come live in Orange and Athol? Peter, Sam, Royalston, Phillipston. It's not a far commute, it's a gorgeous commute. You come by the river, it's absolutely beautiful. There's new money coming in, new people. We have a gorgeous place to live, very affordable homes. How do we leverage that? We have to keep our schools strong. We have some concerns right now with the performance of some of our schools in the district. That will really hurt people from choosing to raise their kids and their families in our district. So we have to be uh, tenacious on that and make sure that we build those. Um, and also the culture we have to keep uh, growing. The 1794 house, the creative economy, the festivals, cider festivals, the farms. This is a wonderful place to live. It's an unknown secret by many. And so we got to wisely reach out, um, share the praises of what we have, positively recruit people, and encourage folks to invest in particularly the new district in the towns. Thank you. Ms. Lee. Well. Obviously, everything this evening seems to cycle back to jobs. Um, the reason we have such a high foreclosure rate in the 2nd Franklin District is because of the lack of jobs. When people come to look at setting up a business, the first thing they do is they look at the schools, they look at the local services. The town of Athol, for example, we have several foreclosed homes. We need to attract business. We need business to build, it's almost chicken and egg. We need businesses to build up our schools and get our schools performing better so we attract people. We also need those jobs and we need people owning the homes and paying their property taxes so our schools are better and we have more to attract people there. Um, community spirit is a great idea for leading people in 
but we've got to put our money where our mouth is and we have to give economic incentives to get businesses in. And once there's work, there'll be fewer foreclosures. There'll be more people wanting to come in town. We've got a lot of development happening in the town of Athol recently. Um, the Athol Commons is one of those um, that the Athol Edict is responsible for getting going there. Also, the um, Athol Public Library will be another gem in the center of the town. My dream is to see the center of the town of Athol to look like a Brattleboro someday and have a few cute restaurants and some nice shops. But again, we need to build up our economy. We need to build up our work base, build up our tax base, and the foreclosure problem will solve itself. And our next question, kind of continuing on with jobs. Um, as a state legislator, how do you find your role as helping the region to bring on new businesses to the region to improve the job picture in the 12 communities that make up the second Franklin seat? Well, in my experience at Whips Incorporated, one of the things we've done over the last several years to grow the company is marketing and effective marketing and showing off a quality product. To go out and entice businesses and show people the services we have available. Athol Memorial Hospital is a terrific asset. We've got other great small hospitals in the area that um, attract, that will attract business because it, the services and the education piece are what people look for. Um, it, it's going to be a ground leg, grassroots, knock on doors, let people know what we have. We also need to depend on the Commonwealth to help us with our message. When, in 1930, when the Commonwealth of Massachusetts decided they needed a drinking water source and they flooded four towns in the center of the state, they put our area at a huge disadvantage by disallowing any north to south travel in the central part of the state because of the Quabbin Reservoir. Now, the Quabbin Reservoir is a beautiful thing. It's a, we have the most scenic, beautiful district in the area. The fact is, the people in the greater Boston district are provided billions of gallons of water, of drinking water from us, and they, it's time for them to pay. And we need to call in that debt and say, we've provided for you all of these years. It's time you provide for us. Thank you. Representative Andrews. Could you repeat, please? Thanks. As a state legislator, how do you find your role as helping the uh, region to bring on new businesses to the region to improve the job picture in the 12 communities that will make up the second Franklin seat. Thank you. When you look across our 12 communities, we have some very strong and unique needs of the workforce. We have a large group that's in education. You look down in Belchertown, a lot of UMass employees. Um, you look at our public school systems across there. So we have to make sure education funding stays well funded, both at the local level and at the college level. Um, so that those institutions stay vibrant and get their fair share of monies so that we keep that workforce employed. Health care, very important. I continue to work uh, to ensure Athol Memorial Hospital stays funded and the Greenfield Hospital out here with Bay State and to work through issues that could be a risk to those businesses, uh, particularly at the Greenfield Hospital on their union contract. So funding those and making sure again that we provide skilled workforce for that. Farming, another area that's developing. Programs like farm to school, very important opportunity for our local farmers to continue to have um, really competitive contracts with the schools. They're not driving a long way to get their produce to the school. A lot of wins there. The kids are eating healthier food and it's helping lift the economy. Small business, another one. Getting some of the complex regulations out of their way so that they can compete for bigger jobs and, and expand their businesses. Permitting, when permitting issues come up at the state level, I'm there to expedite those, whether it's the, the liquor license we're working now or Dunkin' Donuts or working with the um, Irving Paper Mill to financially reset them or on Athol Commons permitting. Energy cost investment, driving energy costs down for the area, we need to continue to invest in that at the state level and particularly for Irving Paper Mill. Their gas pipeline does not come to that plant. How do we extend that to keep them competitive? Thank you. Our next question uh, to Representative Andrews. 
With some of the expected pending changes to state and federal regulations with regard to biomass, Representative Andrews, can you explain your stance on biomass plants and if you would ever support the construction of such plants in this region, recognizing your strong opposition a couple years ago to a proposed $250 million plant by Pioneer Renewable and Greenfield? And Ms. Lee, what is your stance on renewable energy with regard to having a, possibly a biomass plant built in the district? I'm an opponent to a large-scale biomass. I've gone to, I think, three hearings, read um, several reports about four inches thick. And as an engineer, I believe in data and performance. Those uh, facilities are very low efficiency, so they are not a good investment. They take used wood, whether it's pallets or um, wood in the forest, and they put them through a process that is very low efficiency. So until those efficiencies get up to the 80 percentile, it is not a good investment. Second, the location that we were citing out here is in a valley. The concerns on air quality are unacceptable. The conditions that it would put on our families around here are unacceptable. So I will continue to oppose that. Small scale biomass, we have a facility at uh, Mount Wachusett and down at one of the hospitals in Northampton, I believe. Those have the potential to look uh, better for an application for energy cost reduction. I need to understand the performance of those at a deeper level before I say I'm for that. We're looking at that as one option in one of the main um, manufacturing site renewals in Athol, and we'll do my due diligence to take a hard look at that, keep an open mind, and support alternative energy. Huge supporter of solar, hydro, wind. Huge supporter of reduced consumption. Um, and getting off oil and everything that comes with the problems of our dependency on that. Just one moment, uh, just real quickly, if you could clarify, you referenced 80% uh, with regard to efficiency, 80% exactly what? Conversion, so uh, fuel in, power out. Ms. Lee. Thank you. Um, I agree that um, Large-scale biomass is not something that's been researched enough and we haven't seen a good enough plan for any large-scale biomass um, areas. I do believe um, small-scale for both power and heat is a good idea. Also um, taking into consideration the need for some land management and forestry, but that's not um, an area where I have expertise and that would be something where I, I would look to foresters and other folks um, to help me with that. I'm never going to admit that I know everything and I, I pride myself on being able to go to people who are experts and ask them, you know, where do you stand and why do you stand there and, and talk to both sides um, of the issue and find out where I stand and where the majority of the people in the district are because I am their representative. I'm not there to tell them what's best for them. I want them to tell me what their needs are and what they feel is best for them. I do um, believe that hydro is, is a good source of power. Um, I've worked in the water and wastewater industry for 12 years now and I have an expert sitting at that table over there right now who could teach me several things more with regards to hydro. Um, solar, geothermal, wind, they're, they're all possibilities, and these are great possibilities for private industry to come in and take care of. We shouldn't be investing government money on the research and development of, of these plants. We need to make a business-friendly economy. Thank you. Our next question, starting with Ms. Lee. Earlier this week, each of you were able to garner endorsements for your respective campaigns with Representative Andrews earning the endorsement of Senator Stanley Rosenberg of Amherst, while Ms. Lee collected the endorsement of State Representative Mark Lombardo to go with the notable decision by former Athol Democratic Town Committee Chairman William J. Caldwell to first resign from the board and then to endorse Ms. Lee. Can each of you explain what such endorsements do in bolstering the support for the respective campaigns and then identify what it was that you deem had that individual support your candidacy for a state representative? Ms. Lee. Thank you. Um, well, um, with regards to endorsements, um, 
my local Democratic Town Committee has been shaken up a little bit because several members of that team have decided that I am the better candidate. Um, Kenneth Vadalus, Bill Chasen, Bill Caldwell, Lee Chevette, um, all former um, officers, I believe, in the Athol Town Democratic Committee have come and joined me because they know where my heart is and they know my heart is in our community and they know I will be the right voice. I was very pleased to also um, receive an endorsement from Sheriff Lou Evangelitis. Um, Sheriff Lou is a wonderful guy whose heart is as big as he is tall. He understands me. He understands my family. He understands my place in the community, a place that I've worked hard to put myself in. It's not, you know, Susie's just there. Susie has spent the last 20 years taking care of elders in her community and looking out for her neighbors. And, and Sheriff Lou sees that, and I, I'm incredibly honored that he would endorse me. Um, the Boston Herald, the Worcester Telegram. Again, I, I'm very flattered, but to see people, especially Democrats and people who have been told this is what you have to do and you have to vote the party line, to see them and have them know that me as a Republican has a big heart, that I don't follow the party line, I don't walk lockstep with them, I'm my own thinker, and when I go to Beacon Hill, I'm going to go there to represent everybody in my community and everyone in this district, and they know I'll do them proud. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Representative Andrews. I'm very honored and humbled to have endorsements of many people and organizations, and I hope I earn yours, because yours is as equally important to me as anyone else's, regardless of their level. Governor Patrick yesterday announced that he'll be supporting me, so we'll be doing a press release on that. I'm thrilled. I have such admiration for him and the others. Representative Gloria Fox, our longest serving woman in the State House, African American from the Boston area. Representative Kaufman, Lexington Chair of Revenue and Tax Policy. Senator Dan Wolf, who is the CEO of Cape Air, a business person that, like me, has gone into public service to help our democracy. Senator Rosenberg, a progressive, staunch, long-term serving statesman of Western Mass. Paul Mark, a new representative from Western Mass. Tricia Bouvier-Farley, a new lady from Western Mass. Long-standing Congressman Over, who's done amazing work for this district, a champion, 44 years of service, and Congressman McGovern. The agency's environmental mass teachers, a very difficult endorsement to get. They expect you to perform on education and union and management rights. The Mass Nurses Association, the Mass Social Workers, the SEIU, the Victory Fund, which is the national premier gay, lesbian, and transgender group, and the Environmental League of Voters. So a very diverse group, not your normal uh, one-size-fits-all group and who your clique is. I want a broad group. Why they endorse me? My character, my values, and that I work together with people, respect people, and get results. Thank you. And our final question for the moderator uh, segment of the debate, and we will start with Representative Andrews. As we all know, this state representative race took a major turn when the situation surrounding Representative Andrews, Ms. Lee, and discredited drug allegations became public. Do you feel this situation has overshadowed the real issues of the camp campaign, even to where Boston Herald columnist Howie Carr has written on the matter? And how have you sought to return attention to those major issues? And do you feel it is still instructive for voters as they go to the polls? The issue is getting more airtime than it should um, because we have serious issues on housing, jobs, et cetera. However, it, those issues need to be addressed. But I think it's more responsible to keep it in perspective. So it has gotten a bit out of perspective. Um, and what I do is I stay focused on doing my job as a state rep, working on the issues and working very hard to share with you what we've accomplished and what we will continue to do as your state representative. 
I want to be crystal clear because there's been very wide variation of opinion and truth. When there's an ongoing investigation, the appropriate recourse is to keep things private. As your state representative, when a constituent comes forward, I did my job, I do it again, I take it to the authorities. I am not the one that was on Fox News, the breaking story. I am not the one that had the report that was released to the press. I am not the one that is making judgments when there's an open investigation going on. It is irresponsible to do that and disrespectful of what is needed. It has caused significant damage to our community. I am thrilled that the district attorney is getting involved from the AG's office. I am the one, as well as Chief Anderson, that asked the AG to come in and help get to the bottom of these things because it still has not been an adequate job in addressing the original concern or how things are handled. And the district attorney is working through that. I met with him this week in Greenfield. And because it's an ongoing investigation, I will continue to do what I've done. Stay focused on my job and let the professionals do their investigation. And I hope we will get to the bottom of it and put it to bed and put more priority both in the newspaper and as we have conversations on how do we create jobs? How do we help our seniors? How do we build farms? How do we have some fun in our district and get some things done. Thank you. Ms. Lee. Well, the original concern, which was Ms. Andrews going to the police and making a, a false report, an unfounded report, that is a closed investigation. The chief looked at everything and it was preposterous. This, it is a closed investigation. Um, the fact that the chief determined I did nothing wrong, Officer Jarrett Musso did nothing wrong. There's never been an apology. I have grown up knowing that you don't always do things right. When you wrong somebody, when you hurt somebody, you say you're sorry. I've never received an apology. I don't expect to. The people in the district didn't receive a, an apology when it was discovered that a representative was working in New Jersey. I think the, the most important part of, of this whole thing, it's taught me the kind of person I am and it's taught me that I can hold my head up and I can go about life and there are some people out there who are mean and who say untruths and who don't do fact finding and who have poor judgment and it was displayed in this manner that one of us has very poor judgment and it's proved the kind of person she is. And, and I really feel bad, but the fact that this could happen and nobody, um, not nobody, Miss Andrews has never apologized to me, nor has she apologized to Officer Jarrett Musso. And she charged, his charge, what he was investigated for was neglect of duty, which is a much more serious issue than her charging me with possession. And again, they were both unfounded and no apology. Thank you. What's that? When a name is referenced specifically, are we doing? Well, I mean, we have, we'll have the oppor uh, opportunity to uh, answer with regard to the candidate to candidate She's question. She's going to apologize. I'm happy to give her a few seconds. <laughs> I will give you the floor for 15 seconds. For 15 seconds. Um, as I said, there is an open investigation to both get at the original concern and how it was handled. So until that's done, I will reserve judgment and comment. And based on that, you will see from me the appropriate actions. Thank you. And now we will have the segment of candidate to candidate questions. And uh, that was uh, uh, out of, pulled out of a hat. And Ms. Lee has the opportunity to ask the first question. And you will then uh, have the opportunity to ask the, the following question. And each of you will have an opportunity to ask three questions in all. Ms. Lee. Hi. Um. What was your community involvement and volunteer record for the people of this district prior to running for office? Strong. I had returned to Massachusetts and immediately got involved in the ORP group, which is a historical group that's worked on parks, Starry Night, and community projects. Clearly not living here, I did my community service where I was living. So whether it's taking folks down in New Orleans to rebuild after the Katrina, which we did two years in a row, um, probably 10 people from our company, or whether it was working in Cincinnati, Lexington, Puerto Rico, wherever my family was living, we prioritized with our church, 
in our friends to give back at the soup kitchens, community projects, or in public service, or on elections. And when I, I've never left, really, every time I've come home, we've had long conversations in the living room because my parents are very active, as you know, in community projects. So I'd give my thoughts and opinion on how to help support some of the projects they were working on here. At times, make donations, because we were blessed in, to have a position to be able to do that, whether it's supporting the, the kids' programs for their state championship volleyball, or whether it's rebuilding Memorial Park. If you go through the park, it's kind of funny. We even have little plaques for our dogs because mom was a tenacious salesperson to raise money through her kids to rebuild that park which you know coming from this town from since since 1635 our family i love it here i've done virtual community service and when we've come back home we've rolled up our sleeves like them and got to work um just um for brief history for the folks watching in irving and gill um, for the last 10 years, I've been the president of the Ethel Historical Society. During that time, we raised $328,000 to restore the oldest public building in the town. I've worked on the Friends of the Council on Aging. I'm a charter member, and I helped form the 501c3 that brings money to our local Council on Aging. I've been on the board of selectmen in the town of Ethel for six years. I'm currently the chairman. Um, as far as my family goes and my business goes we give to the Salvation Army and we give our time to everybody who is in need in our area that we can help and an opportunity for you to ask a question now yeah sure Vermont Yankee has not been properly managed and should be shut down responsibly do you agree with this what issues must be addressed by Vermont Yankee whether it is closed or it remains open well, I believe there's a contract between Vermont Yankee and, and the area, and as a contract administrator and somebody who reads through contracts every day, I believe you keep your word and you do what you're supposed to do. Unfortunately, uh, which as a contract administrator, I would have asked at the beginning of this contract they had, what are you going to do to close? What's your exit procedure? What are you going to do with your employees? How are you going to treat this? What's the alternate energy source you're going to have when you decide to shut down that plant? Um, it's never been dealt with properly. It's never been managed well. And right now, there needs to be discussion with regards to what the alternative energy source will be, what's going to happen with the employees there and a safe and proper shutdown if that's what's going to happen. Since you are a neighbor and Athol is within a disaster zone if that fails, and what have you done to dig into the safety of that site, the evacuation routes for the people, particularly as a select board person? And do you have thoughts on if that closes, how will we backfill the revenues that are supplied to Irving? Well, with regards to an evacuation plan, we have um, a terrific team of emergency managers in the town of Athol. We actually just met earlier today to discuss the impending storm. Um, there's experts for that. I'm not going to claim to be an expert, but I, I work with the emergency management team as a member of the Board of Selectmen, and I'm also, whenever there is an emergency or shelter set up in town, um, I'm always called to assist, and I would definitely allow the experts to guide me, but I would be there with my sleeves rolled up, and I'd be pitching in and helping. Thank you. Ms. Lee, your next question. You've mentioned your 10-year plan for economic recovery for the district um, several times. Please tell us what the action plan is for years one through three. One through three is to, f to firm up the industrial clusters to get resources around that from the private and public, to strategize and lay out specific goals, results, and track those and what's needed for investment and projects because each of those projects will take anywhere between 10 agencies coming together from the private and public sector. And so building ownership of that plan, people who can deliver it, and the support for that, both the support internally with our agencies, whether it's the Massachusetts Planning Group 
whether it's the Franklin County Planning Group, our housing agencies, our transportation across the clusters of agriculture, tourism, manufacturing, um, and green energy. So we've got actively working, I would say, seven people to drive that zero to three and then 10 years. So it's a year to one to three of thinking and planning out and there's real, no real action happening no there. Action. It's okay. tracking job growth. You know, one of the ideas is that we need 600 jobs. How do we piece those together? You heard we have about 200 cooking. And then what are the key projects that we invest? Getting alignment with the chambers and capacity in the chambers, Franklin County and Athol. Getting alignment of the housing and investment money, the tax credits and the funding, whether it's coming from the federal or state level, into the specific clusters to drive those projects. That's what we're doing, and we're getting results. Thank you. Uh, next question, Representative Vance. <laughs> if you are elected, what are the first three bills you would file, and why? Hmm. Um, well, I've spoken to Representative Rich Bastien and the likely new rep from um, Lemonster about co-sponsoring legislation to create a Route 2 economic corridor. Um, also, I'd, I'd want to retweak the Gateway Community Act and also look into duplicate um, regulations that affect small businesses. Since you reach across the aisle, are both of those Republican or are you reaching across to the Democrats to help build, particularly since they're the majority in the House and you'll need that support to get any bill through? Well, these two particular gentlemen are, are Republicans, but I certainly would have, obviously, I mean, eight, 18 or 20 percent of the, of the legislature is Republican, so I would be reaching across and working. I mean, fact of the matter is, Democrats need jobs. Gay people need jobs. Straight people need jobs. White people need jobs. Black people need jobs. We need to work together. We need to stop putting labels on ourselves. And as a representative, I would do that by going and sitting and working with anybody who would listen to me. And I will beat that drum to get people to come and realize what we need to do. It's not about the letter after my name. It's about the heart and the, the effort I'll put into it. Thank you. Ms. Lee, opportunity to ask a question. Exactly how many full-time benefited jobs have you yourself created for the 2nd Franklin District? Athol Commons and Walmart really aren't legislative details, so I'm not going to allow you to take credit for those. The legislature in my job does intervene to create jobs, okay? Getting the Greenfield High School to be a new building versus the rehab took personal intervention by me with, this, with the school building and uh, Treasurer Grossman. Without that, we would have a, a refreshed Greenfield High School. Um, the same thing on Athol Commons permitting, that could delay by months. Every day is a job, every day is somebody's paycheck, and every day could put that family at risk again. So I do believe my role is to help drive those. Personally hiring, I've hired probably six people, interns, both for the campaign and their paid positions. They're not benefited positions. I'm not, at a, as a state rep, making the kind of money where I could do that. If I did, I'd be happy to. Because I believe in paying people both good working wage and giving benefits for long-term security. The Walmart expansion fell off the track. I picked the phone up because of my relationship with a lobbyist and said, we cannot afford to have this project go off the track. Please tell me what I need to do as a state representative and working with the local community to get it back on the track. We had groundbreaking last week where there'll be 60 to 70 new jobs. Um, I'm very proud of that. I'm a team player. Results take teams. I do not take credit for single performance. I will take my fair share of credit for my contribution as a team member for the jobs created and the next wave of jobs we have to do. Just um, with regards to the Greenfield High School, um, the application for the Greenfield High School was put in in 2008, which I don't believe you lived in the area at that time. And also, when Narragansett School was built in Templeton, they received over 85% um, aid from SBA. Greenfield's getting 60%. Why the difference? One, the 
the policy on what is the state reimbursement has changed to. On Greenfield High School, you're absolutely right. The application went in long before I was here. However, when the principal picked up the phone and said, she did not believe this was the best decision for the community or the students. Then I engaged with the community and said, what is going on? They wanted to keep their auditorium. The auditorium is not in the current model for investment by the state. They don't understand that we don't have other meeting spaces. And so uh, through a college friend that I went to UMass with, she says, you need to know Catherine Craven. Catherine Craven's ahead of mass business or mass school buildings. We had a conversation. She got Grossman out here. We toured them. We changed that to where we're building a new school, 70 or 66 million and all the jobs that go with that. And the last question uh, uh, goes to Representative Andrews. Have you attended the Gill and Irving town meetings, yes or no, and what are these towns' top concerns? I haven't attended their town meetings. Um, I attend the Athol town meeting because I'm generally required to be there. Um, I, I know you make a point to attend as many town meetings as you can. Um, you've never come in and spoken to the select board in town. Um, never step foot into the Athol Royalston School District. So as a state representative, if the Board of Selectmen asked me to be present at their meeting, I would absolutely be there. Um, my plan when elected is to have a representative from each one of the towns that keeps me in the loop and allows me to be on top of what's going on in their communities. Um, not going and sitting at a town meeting is, um, just it's something I just haven't had the opportunity or the time to do based on what I'm doing. I'm still working 40 hours a week. I'm not paid by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to go and sit at every town meeting right now. Okay. I have attended a select board meeting um, and I have spent time in the Athol Regional School District including meeting with the superintendent a few weeks ago as well as talking to teachers. When I'm attending the town meetings they're usually on an evening uh, or sometimes in Gill, a weekend. And to me, what's very important is to get up close and personal to hear what's going on. Irving and Gill uh, do deserve a candidate to know them before they vote for them. I could have chosen to stay out of the new seven towns. I was working a full-time state rep job, and I made a point to visit all those seven towns, go to town meetings, and visit the schools. So it's possible, and it's important to know people and what they need before you ask for their vote. <laughs> Would you just give us the details of your meeting with the Athol School Superintendent two weeks ago because I heard it was rather unpleasant for him. It was not the most productive because we have some issues on are we going to collaborate on serious budget issues for the school. Operational budget gaps that the state is asking and going to look for Athol to pay back and will they be able to do that. And second, the capital investment that's needed in the high school because we have mold in the, in the gyms and we don't have a master plan for our school buildings in Athol that's going to be affordable yet and we don't have one for Templeton in the surrounding areas. You told him he was underqualified and overpaid and were very insulting to him from what I've been told by him. Well that's not correct Susie. No. Well now we move on to the audience provided questions. Uh, we had a good number of uh, questions to choose from and uh, we're going to ask a total of six questions in all. And we will start with uh, Ms. Lee and then do a rotating basis from that, uh, from that point forward. What is the greatest threat to the environment in, in our district and what can we do about it? Well, the greatest threat to our environment, if something were to go wrong, would be um, Vermont Yankee, obviously. Um, but that's, that's something, again, that needs to be worked with. We're talking about a situation that's actually out of state. Um, the Massachusetts legislature, I don't know how much authority they have and how much power they have to tell Vermont what to do. I know we are, again, in a dangerous area if something were to happen. Um, but I have faith that, you know, they, they will come to some sort of resolution and that will be able to be disbanded. Um, one of the greatest threats to our well-being it's a lack of jobs and employment that we have in the, in the second Franklin district. There's social ills that come with unemployment. Ronald Reagan said the best social programs a job. And he was exactly right. 
we need to get our people to work. We need to bring jobs to the area. And every, that is one of the greatest threats to our area right now is the lack of jobs, the lack of hope, the lack of stability that somebody feels when they're able to put food on their table and put a roof over their children's head. Representative Anders. He clearly is the Vermont Yankee. Um, safety and the meltdown possibility and the effects it would have on this community. I take that very serious. I've spent 17 years in manufacturing plants um, where I know the, the privilege of a business to be able to work in a community. I know the importance to return people home, employees home with all their fingers and toes and to keep the communities environmentally sound and be a good neighbor. Vermont Yankee has not done that. So what do I do? After working all day in Boston, I go to Greenfield and spend three hours at an evacuation meeting. Why? Because I have a voice. Is it in my area of control? No. Is it in my area of influence? You bet. We have power beyond means to do things that we can control on showing up and learning, protesting, getting arrested, writing letters to the governor of the state, writing letters to the president, writing letters and forming a coalition. I've done all that. When there's something that important, I will use my voice, I'll use my diplomacy, I will use my every part of me to be a champion with other folks who've been working on this a long time. Hattie, Hattie from Athol, folks, you know, when I was in school were working to deal with this. So I will continue to do that. We have to make sure those workers are taken care of. I have friends who work there and they're like, if you close it, where will I work? As a business manager, HR manager, when you close plants, you give people what they've earned. Great severance, great retraining, and you honor them for the work they did. They're not the ones that didn't invest in that plant or keep it viable. Thank you, Representative Andrews. Our next question uh, to Representative Andrews first. What are the greatest problems facing women in our district, and how would you address these problems? We just had, and I was happy to help work with the Mass Commission uh, for Women. We got a Western Mass person appointed this week, Margot Parrott, per who's in the audience. There's a 17-person commission that advises the governor. We only had one lady from Western Mass. We had a hearing this week. I went to that. I kicked it off. I spoke as a humanist, a feminist, and a person who will work on equal rights till the day I breathe my last breath. The issues for our women here, men, you die before us. We're left to live without pensions, companionship, and some of the safety nets that you provided your wives. How do we shore that up? We have health issues for women. We have women who don't have transportation in this rural area. We have um, the need for, for jobs. There's discrimination once pretty much you're over 45, being able to go back and get a, a, a role that you're qualified for. So putting those issues on the table, working at them, is what I do. The young women, they need to believe in themselves. We had a great uh, forum at the high school. Half of the people in charge of that were women. I made a point to share that as a woman who will pull other women up, I think when Susie got elected, I wrote her a personal note congratulating her when I returned to say, it is nice to see a lady select person win. As women in this district, what do we do? So I really get the diversity thing as a woman in business and manufacturing plants. Um, harassment still happens. Dumbing down as a young girl still happens. Having women objectified happens all the time. You can get ahead for being cute and pretty, but if you're smart, it's not cool. So I try to be very upfront um, and share a model that will encourage men and women on what's needed while we work on the systemic issues. I am privileged to have served for at least three years with Governor Patrick as the lead of his Diversity Council for the Commonwealth. And rural women's issues will get more attention than, than they have because of what I learned this week at that forum. One of the biggest problems facing women is fear. It's fear for being able to provide for their families. It's fear for not being able to take care of themselves if their spouse dies. Um, but to say women are not going to be able to take care of themselves if their husband passes, I grew up with a lot of really strong women. And I really believe that 
There are women out there who are taking care of their husbands. And there are some families out there where the woman's the one bringing in the paycheck. Um, I'm a human being before anything else. And I've been asked to join the Women's Republican Group or Women for Scott Brown. And I don't join any of those because the labels, I think, hold us back a bit. We're people, we're all working together. I think moms out there, again, they fear for their children. They fear, and all parents fear that their children's life for the first generation ever, their kids won't have it as easy as they had it. That's a huge fear amongst people. As my grandparents grew up, they always said we wanted your parents to have it better than us, and we're supposed to have it better than them. That's not the case anymore. We need to work, and again, the biggest problems facing everybody in this district is the lack of employment, the lack of municipal aid coming to our areas that's gonna help with public safety and help with our education. Do I hate to sound like a, I'm repeating myself constantly, but we come back again to jobs. Next question to Ms. Lee. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts voted to unionize home-based daycares. Could you explain uh, how you would vote uh, on, on the matter? And to Representative Andrews, can you explain how you voted and why? I believe in the right to work. I don't think anybody should be forced to pay dues to a union, especially if that dues is used um, no differently than Citizens United uses their money. Um, again, I believe, I'm not pro-union, I'm not anti-union, I'm pro-worker. I've got 64 employees right now, 64 families that work um, for me, and I, I don't believe that anybody should have to pledge allegiance to any organization other than their country and their family. And I, I have a problem with a daycare worker being sucked into a giant union where they'll be lost. And I, I would not vote in favor of it. I voted for it. And I've spent my whole career on the management side of the bargaining table. And I think many people were amazed, particularly in Greenfield, how pro-union I am. What I am is pro checks and balances of power. And what I am is pro good unions and pro good management. At the end of the day, you have to have respect across the table to say, how do we create a successful, viable business that shares prosperity with its workers, whether you're on the factory floor or you're sitting at the CEO table? And there's not such a disparity between that in wealth generation benefits or respect. So I voted for that. Why else did I vote for it? If you look at unions, they've brought us some very good things, and at times not such good things. We have child labor laws, we have weekends, we have decent wage rates, we have decent benefits. We have to stay viable. Um, I was very active when we had to reset union plants in Procter and Gamble and get those competitive. I've worked with the Teamsters. If the car companies can reset with the Teamsters, that means we can work together. So I don't buy, particularly in municipalities, when people keep saying we can't deal with our unions locally and walk away and allow ineffective spending to occur at the state level or at the local level or at the federal level. The other reason I vote for it, in home care, nursing, et cetera, those are highly populated by women. And the last time I checked, I think we're still making, as women, 70 cents on the dollar. And so there's a discrepancy. When you look at what unions did for the police, which is highly male populated, they've got some progress on pay and benefits. I believe the unions, for particularly the industries populated with women, are best served in making progress and will help management perhaps do the right thing. Thank you, Representative Our next question to Representative Vanders. The income tax rollback was a ballot question in 2000, and voters passed it, but it never went into effect. Beacon Hill has had a chance to roll it back, but has not done so. Now, uh, how did you vote uh, with regard to the income tax rollback? And to Ms. Lee, how would you vote if that were to come uh, on the House floor? I didn't vote. I wasn't living here then. Um, when you look at revenue policy and tax policy, citizens decide what they want on education, roads, investment, building, you name it. 
Then we have to pay our taxes um, to fund that, and then we have to decide, is that the right investment, or should we raise more taxes or cut services? Currently, we are the second strongest state in the, in the United States on our bond rating and our fiscal management. Coming from business, I know how, very well how to manage the bottom line and balance long and short-term plans on operational and capital. So until the Commonwealth has stronger jobs, a stronger tax base, and some services better performing, one big gross misconduct is the MBTA that needs improved efficiency. We can't afford to roll back taxes. However, being on the Revenue Committee, um, I hope this year we will actually do revenue policy reform because I do believe citizens do need some relief on taxes and we've got to be able to get some more money in to people's pockets so that they can have a little bit easier time on college tuition bills, daily living, taking care of elders. But as analysis and comprehensive reform will require, complex issue, um, and we'll need to look at that and make sure fair share is being paid by the companies. Right now we don't tax internet sales in the Commonwealth. That's a lot of money, several hundred million. And until we're willing to adjust some of these things, we also have not been oversighting $300 billion in tax expenditure. I was one of the handful of legislators that said this is unacceptable, that should have oversight. We don't write checks without oversight. So I am hopeful that we can roll back some taxes for the individuals. We have to do it responsibly so that we can maintain our services, education, roads, et cetera, and that we can build the kind of rainy day funds and capital that we need. Thank you, Representative Anders. Ms. Lee. Well, I think more money in the pockets of the people in the community puts more money into the local economy and allows us to thrive a bit more. Um, again, typical threats of government, we're either going to cut services or we have to raise taxes. That's not the only answer. We need to look at the money. Earlier this year, they found over $50 million dollars of extra money that was in a fund that was from inspection fees on vehicles. In 1999, the price of vehicle inspection went from $15 to $29 to provide emission testing machines for all of the garages who do inspections. The um, machines got paid for and they continued to overcharge the vehicle owners in the Commonwealth by $14. That money built up over $15 million and Instead of being used on roads and bridges and areas where vehicle owners go, um, that money was voted to go to the MBTA, which most people out here in the 2nd Franklin District don't ride the T. Um, we need to look at our pennies and what's going on, because if you watch the pennies, the dollars take care of themselves. And we have a great deal of waste in this Commonwealth. We, need, we talk about education being too expensive. Well, when the University of Massachusetts can pay their president $600,000 in salary and benefits for a one-year sabbatical, there's something wrong with that system. We need to look at where the waste is and stop threatening we're going to raise taxes or cut services. It's not tax and spend. It's, it's watching over and managing taxpayers' dollars. Our next question. With the redistricting for the second Franklin seat, Belchertown will be split with one precinct in the second Franklin and explain how you will represent the town and how would you work with the other segment of Belchertown to serve the whole town? Well, you can look at Belchertown as two different, two different ways. Um, a town divided with two separate representatives or you can look at it as a town that has an incredible opportunity of having two people representing it. I will work together with whomever is the other representative in the town of Belcher Town to make sure that they get the services needed and they, they get the attention. When you look at the redistricting in the state, the Belcher Town really was kind of given the short end of the stick as to get from the second Franklin North part, you go through two other districts in um, Pelham and, and Shootsbury and Leverett to get down to Belchertown. I think it was a disservice and I do everything I could to have them relook at the structure, but I certainly 
would be in Belchertown and answer to the needs of the citizens of Belchertown just as I would any of the other citizens in the district. And again, they have the benefit of two representatives working for them and I look forward to ganging up with the other rep and doing what we can for the people of Belchertown. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Representative Andrews. I totally agree with it's an opportunity to have two representatives and one senator to work together behalf on Belchertown so they get basically another representative on their team. I have the same concerns though when we redistricted because we had three representatives and two senators in the old district. Now we'll have one representative and two senators. So that's pretty important to send the most capable representative back to support the new district. And when I look at Belchertown, I have gone door to door. I've met seven llamas probably, a <laughs> hundred people, uh, visited the school twice, sat down with the superintendent uh, to hear her plans, the health of the, the, the school and what's needed, attended their um, meetings and read their annual report. Belchertown is blessed with means. Um, Belchertown has some different ideas than, than our other 11 towns. All of us are unique towns. All of us have our strengths, all of us have our flat spots, just like people. However, as a person who's worked years on how to get the best out of everybody, to do collaborative solutions and build high performance models that serve everyone, I'm really looking forward to that. Having 50% uh, the district new, seven new towns, more the same size, and leveraging the relationships that we've built with Greenfield, because Greenfield will continue to be a partner on behalf of its neighboring towns. So Belcher Town will be re well represented um, with three people in the new second Franklin. Really think hard about you have one representative now instead of three. We still have two senators. So uh, how do we synergize and make sure that we have good solutions for all 12 of our towns? Thank you, Representative Anders. And our final question of the audience provided questions, and to start off with Representative Andrews. What do you see is needed for either expanding or implementing senior housing in the towns of Irving and Gill? Right now we have behind the wagon wheel where I get many chocolate milkshakes <laughs> as I tour across the district between there and Bruce's. We have some very good uh, senior housing behind wagon wheel. And when I look at the inventory stock with the housing authority, we're in decent shape. Where we're not is in Irving. The first meeting I went to the senior center when I was running in the first campaign, one of the ladies that lives near Irving, Northfield, she wants senior housing built. I know Irving um, just built a senior center Different opinions on that by the townspeople at the end of the day, they invested in that. The master plan is how do we build senior housing right there. We had uh, Chair Alice Wolf out for a senior symposium. Alice agreed to work with us to put together a, uh, the needed resources to build an Irving senior housing. At the end of the day, again, it will probably take 22 stakeholders and pieces and parts of different pies from the federal, state, and some from the local taxpayers to say, how do we invest? Because I'll never forget what she said to me. I live in a big house in Northfield. I can't maintain it anymore, but I don't want to move away from my friends in my final stages. I would like to be able to live here and continue to have those relationships. So that project's on my list. It is unfortunate that the wheels of government take much longer than the private sector. I'm working on that because I do think it should not take 20 years to build some of these projects. When I t was told a bridge took 30, I almost choked. Um, because it, that's unacceptable. That's why I'm in public service from the private sector, to bring some of those um, skills and learn the strengths of the public sector, marry those two, and bring projects like senior housing to Irving sooner. Thank you. I missed it. Thank you. Um, again, I, I've displayed a dedication to seniors in, in my area um, for most of my life. I actually think it's very important that seniors have the ability to stay in their homes as long as they can. Um, I had my grandma living with me until she was 94 years old and um, my other grandma until she was 96 living next door to me. It's important that we take care of our seniors. Um, we're also finding this sandwich generation where there's a lot of people, a lot of our baby boomers are hitting that age but They've got parents, they've got kids and grandkids and everybody's trying to take care of each other. Um, affordable housing, good senior housing are very important projects. Um, in the town of Athol, we created the Athol Residences. Um, we repurposed um, the original high school, which was then the middle school. Um, 
we've watched, seen some of the successes there. We've seen some of the things we've done differently. I'm very confident that we can work together with private industry and some state help to provide more senior housing for the people who need it and also affordable housing in the district. One of the things, there's such a great need for affordable housing and why stop now? I'm gonna bring it back to jobs. Um, with regards to the need for affordable housing, if we could bring more jobs and economic development to the area, the people who need the subsidies and the affordable housing could get back to work and we'd have more spaces for our seniors who really need it and are disabled. All right, thank you, Ms. Lee. And now we will move on to closing statements. And again, that was done uh, by pulling a number out of a bin. And Ms. Lee, you have uh, first opportunity. Well, I thank you very much for this evening. Um, I was gonna read something prepared, but I figure it's best to speak my truth um, and let the folks out here know who I am. Um, you've heard me answer questions tonight. It's probably not enough. Uh, if you'd like to call me or contact me, my number's in the book. I'm available via my website. I, I want to work for you. I want to help you out. Um, I've lived my life here. I'm a hardworking girl. I don't think you'll find anybody who says I haven't given my all to my community. I look forward to the opportunity to have a change in jobs and, and leave my company and come and work for you and with you and show you what I've done in the town of Athol. I plan to give my heart just as much to the other 11 towns as I have to my hometown. Again, I'm not going to Beacon Hill. I'm bringing them here for you. I'm gonna work hard. I'm gonna bang the drum. I'm gonna let them know that it's time for the people in the second Franklin district to get some special attention from the state. I'm gonna reach across the aisle. I'm gonna work with everybody. And I hope I have your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Representative Andrews. I'm gonna start with a quote by J.F. Kennedy. I think it's appropriate, particularly when you turn on the TV or you listen to some of the local rhetoric. And it goes like this. But I think the American people expect more from us than cries of indignation and attack. The times are too grave, the challenge too urgent, and the stakes too high to permit the customary passions of polit political debate. We are not here to curse the darkness, but to light the candles that can guide us through the darkness to a safe and sane future. In our district, we have been lighting candles. We are on, I believe, an upswing. We have jobs coming to the area. We've kept the paper mill afloat. Walmart's expanding, Athol Commons is coming, the farms are, are growing. Grand Canyon University is moving up the street. There is wonderful things happening and candles being lit. What you'll continue to get from me and my team as your state representative is you better believe, tenacity to fight for the people of this district to get our fair share in the respect that we deserve and that we earn. We won't take handouts, we'll earn it the old fashioned way, but we will get our fair share. I'll continue to collaborate and I'll drive progress for all 12 towns. You'll see me in your restaurants, you'll see me at your events, and we'll be enjoying the community which we love and my family has chosen to return back to. I wanna personally thank my family and the volunteers of my committee. I am extremely proud of how hard you work and the character that you carry yourselves. It's a privilege to work with you. I hope I have the privilege to continue as your state representative in Boston. I will work diligently for all towns. We'll have some fun, we'll rock the house, and we'll grow old together and we'll make a difference. So you know what I'm gonna end with. Be blessed and be a blessing, and please vote for me as your state representative on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Andrews. And now a closing statement. Thank you to the two of the three candidates who are here tonight uh, for the state representative seat for the new 2nd Franklin District, Representative Denise Andrews and Susanna Whipsley for offering their insight to all the questions debated tonight in Irving for the last of four debates, as well as to the audience for their participation. Our hope is that this debate has offered members of the community valuable background into each of the candidates heading into the general election on Tuesday, November 6th, to have a better understanding of who you will vote for and why. So with that, this is Andres Camano, Senior News Editor of the Gardner News, saying good night and I again ask you that you make it to the polls to vote on Tuesday, November 6th, 
in the general election. Thank you and good night.